Um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I tried to kind of touch on that in this little um, kind of conclusion there, if you can call it that. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think resistance is the is the solution. I just think it's um, it, it's impossible to put the genie back in the mod, in the bottle. I can't imagine us kind of retreating to the hills, um, throwing away our iPhones and turning off Netflix and raising chickens and pigs and growing blueberries. Um, I think that kind of myth of the local is a fantasy um, that we can never return to. Um, uh, I guess what I'm interested in doing with, with something like City Everywhere or the projects that we do is, is trying to map out um, uh, these conditions um, so that we can start to understand them and start to work with them as designers. Right? Like whenever we start a project in a building like this one, normally like you get given a site um, and then you do some site analysis, like these are the traffic flows, these are how people approach it, these are the views to and from, um, uh, and then we start to make a building. I'm interested in what it means to start to reimagine what that notion of site might mean. Because really to understand that particular point in a city where you might be putting something, um, you have to understand all of city everywhere and the contingent landscapes that both construct that site and also are affected and produced by that site. So I'm interested in what it means for us to engage with that notion of site, the site as a network condition. As designers, what do we then do in response to that? Because really the scale of the building or in the conversation about technology, the scale of the phone or the laptop is actually compressed um, on top of the scale of territory and landscape. When you're designing one, you're actually designing the other. The two things aren't different disciplines. They're exactly the same. Um, what does it mean to actually reverse engineer that system, to not design the building on that site, but to design a new system of flows, to reimagine the network that produces that building, um, so the objects that we make as designers might just kind of coalesce like a cloud out of this system of flows. Like I think there's a way to start to imagine buildings as kind of relational objects that strategically set in motion some conditions that might play out across another side of the planet. Um, uh, yeah, so I think there's ways for us to operate, but you know, the, the first clues to it are, I think, reimagining this kind of, um, this form of site um, as, a, as a starting point, as a ground condition. Don't bite. Uh, uh. Oh, you just bite. What? Just there. Just shout. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. Um, hi. Um, I was just wondering what is Unknown Fields doing currently in. What is the latest? I guess um, the in, the India thing was 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 um, pretty recent. Um, that was our most recent film that that's uh, that's out on the circuit now. Um, uh, our project this year is Australia, um, so we're looking at gold. Um, I started to touch a bit on that, but um, gold is this extraordinary material that, as a, as a metal, it has it's pretty useless actually. It's really really soft, um, uh, so. Um, it can't be used for, for, for anything particularly useful. Um, it just happened to occur in the sites where civilization was growing in the right kind of quantities that made it appeal, appear kind of rare and precious, uh, and it was shiny and the color of the sun. Um, so now it's got this prescribed, prescribed kind of value. Um, but beyond that, it's kind of meaningless. We just kind of trade as a virtual commodity. We may as well be tra trading buttons or um, or uh, plastic bottle lids or something like it. it um, it's just really a placeholder for, for wealth. Um, uh, but we go to this extraordinary expense, um, both in, in indigenous landscape value terms, but also in literal um, financial terms, to dig it out of the ground, just to ship it across the other side of the world, put it back in the ground for it to be traded virtually, locked away in HSBC vaults. Um, so it's a really weird and bizarre material. Um, uh, but the one thing it is used for is, um, uh, it's one property is that it's non-corrosive, which is why, you know, if you get an expensive uh, set of headphones, the, the, the headphone jack is, is plated in gold or 
your circuit board, some of your electronics has gold in it. And like I said in the in the story, we all have I think 0 0.034 grams of gold um, from Australia in our pockets right now uh, in our phones. Um, we want to try and tell the story of this um, strange and, and weird material um, and what it means and and why we go to this trouble to get it out of the ground. So that's the latest unknown fields thing. Um, and I think next year we're doing uh, color. Color is also fucking weird. Like, like where where does color come from? It comes from beaches in Madagascar. Um, if you want white, uh, then you have to dig up a beach somewhere. Um, that's another story. Yeah, um, uh, we're doing more. So we're doing less stuff. Like we don't. We used to take lots of people out. So I used to do these things and say, "Hey, join us on our next trip." But um, uh, we stopped doing that. We uh, we yeah. We we, we it's more. Um, I don't know. We, it's much more focused now. So we take um, uh, we take film crew and collaborators out with us to make make work. Particularly, um, we started to have problems um, getting access as, as our work became more known. It started to become more difficult to get access to the sorts of places that you see that um, the work revolves around. So um, it's easier for Kate and I to go in with a small camera crew than it is to take twenty bloody students from all over the world and try and pretend that we're like buyers from London um, trying to see the Christmas decoration factory because we want to outsource our UK decoration production to Yiwu. Um, anyway, that, that got a bit a bit old um, after a while. Um, so sorry, but uh, yeah, you can watch the films. Um, So, City Everywhere seems a lot more nuanced than being a straight dystopia or utopia. Um, I think maybe because it's so rooted in where we are right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious, <sighs> oh, words. Um, I'm curious whether you see uh, where it's headed um, in going uh, one way or the other. What sort of, what's your outlook on uh, future prospects for yeah um yeah it's probably not really not good i don't think um uh but uh i mean i'm, I'm less interested in uh I, I don't know if that's necessarily the the most important question to be asking about city everywhere right like it, like what my reckons on where it's going doesn't doesn't really matter um uh, i'm much more interested in where we want it to go um uh, at the moment, it, 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 it's just city Edward just just kind of appeared, you know, like it just got a, sort of crept up on us um, uh, through, um, you know, the extraordinary history of globalization. Like um, uh, when we start to think about futures and speculation, uh, prediction is 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 just one really small part of it. A prediction is just a side effect of these kind of projects that we do. It's not about getting it right. It's not about anticipating what we think might happen. Um, it's about playing out a whole range of possible scenarios so that right now, today, we can make certain decisions and choices. And I think that's, I guess that's what I mean. That's, that's kind of a more important question to be asking is, um, where do we want City Everywhere to go? Do we want to support it? Do we want to kill it? Um, starting to imagine through these speculations a whole range of possibilities of where it could go, not one right one or, or one wrong one, as a means for us to kind of reverse engineer it and work back um, uh, to make more strategic choices now. You know, like if we look at the, the way that these technologies that defined this, this city everywhere have, have come to us, um, they've rushed to market um, before we develop the ideological understanding about what they might mean or the cultural understanding about um, where they will end up. You know, if you just take something as simple as um, file sharing, right? like, like Kim.com, the guy that ran Mega Upload, that, that, that big New Zealand guy, I think he's still in the court system, um, which means that you know, we still haven't figured out what to do with him. We still haven't figured out what to do with this idea that if I um, buy a book, I love it, and I give it to you to read after I'm finished with it, that's sharing. Um, but if I 
watch a film, I love it, I put on a USB drive, I give it to you, that's piracy, right? We, we, that's been around for 20 years. We still don't know what the hell that means. Um, never mind driverless cars or Facebook. Like 15 years after Facebook um, uh, was rolled out uh, into the world, we have a Senate hearing to, to kind of figure out how the fuck it, we elected Donald Trump and, um, and trying to make sense of what it means. Um, uh, you know, potentially in 15 years' time, we're going to have a Senate hearing about the driverless car um, when it, like, knocks over, a, you know, a gang of school kids on their way to buy milk or donuts or whatever they buy. But anyway, the, um, uh, like, now you can't go into an architecture school without seeing the driverless car studio. Um, and I think when we start to talk about these futures or the futures of city everywhere, like it's those type of projects which are really important. Um, I think it's a shame that we weren't doing the driverless car studio 10 years ago when these car companies were investing billions of dollars in um, uh, in their production. Um, because whether we like it or not, no matter what these architectures and urban design studios come up with, the driverless car is coming. Um, because these car companies are so deep, deeply invested already and their lobby is so powerful um, that this is uh, imminent. Um, so all we can do is best prepare. Um, what are the other technologies? What's the next driverless car? And how can we get in the room earlier? Um, I think that's really the question. And hopefully these kind of speculative projects start to frame out different different parts of these different technologies and which ones are going to end up where and start to play them out so that we can come back to a starting point and see, like, how do we regulate some of these things? How do we figure that out, you know? Drones, we did a lot of work with drones because they were at that sweet spot where we could see, um, as they were developed through the military industrial complex, we could see their extraordinary power um, and they were just at the point of becoming democratized in a way where everyone was starting to be able to have access to them. And now, um, a, few years, a, few, a few years later, you can walk down the street and for $200, you can buy a 4K camera drone and learn how to fly it in half an hour. Um, but we we haven't figured out how to regulate them in any way. That's why in the UK you see us people flying drones over the airport, and this one little drone that may or may not have even existed cost billions of dollars and crashed the airport for three days. Um, uh, like there must be a smarter way to to bring technology into the world um, than this. Um, so that's you know, so where's city ever happening? If we keep on doing what we're doing, it's just going to be more of the same. But um, uh, hopefully, um, we're going to figure it out before then. Um, is architecture the wrong discipline for this kind of work? Should there be another discipline? Is architecture is seems archaic in this world as as something to be kind of studied? Um, uh, is there is there a, a new practice? Is there a new profession that should be emerging? A new type of school? Um, is architecture too slow? Um, it depends on what you call architecture, I suppose. Like. Um uh, architecture in the sense that we traditionally define it, um, yeah, it's, that's uh, dead already if it's not going to be in, in, a, in a few years' time. Um, sorry, sorry. Um, <laughs> don't, don't tell your parents um, who are paying the bills. Um, uh, but I guess what, what I mean by that is that, um, you know, the work that I, that I do used to be talked about in galleries, and it still probably is, as being on the margins of the profession. But to be honest, the... And I understand I, will, I, I operate in fairly privileged or rarefied circles, but the people that, that I, most of the people that I know and certainly all of my graduates don't make a living um, working in an architecture office for clients making projects. I think actually those forms of practice are on the margins now. Um, uh, what's a shame and what seems bizarre is that so many of the different schools that I might go to are still training their students for a form of profession and practice that doesn't exist anymore. Um, I totally think architecture is the right discipline to be engaging with this stuff. Um, uh, I think that we have a really unique skill set that sits between technology and culture in the way that, that other disciplines don't. Um, uh, I just think that we spend so much of our time um, 
uh, and so much wasted energy building buildings for um, for capital. Um, you know, the pinnacle of our profession that we see in magazines everywhere is a is a you know a, a, a glamour piece um, for for a despot in the Middle East somewhere, um, or a beach house for some you know rich industrialist. Um, it just seems like a waste of seven years of of really interesting training. Um, so I, I, I don't think you should all quit and go and study film. Um, you should all quit and come to study my program at SciArc, which is somewhere in between the two. Um, but uh, I, I think that we just need to think about how we apply the skills that we learn in a place like this to much more meaningful um, projects than, than you know, some fancy thing that someone can talk about at a dinner party or at a gala opening or something. So, um, yeah, I think I think there's real scope for for us within architecture design disciplines to engage in these in these issues. Because um, I'm not sure who else would, in a way. Um, uh, you know, like if you think about it, again, just to go back to that example of the driverless car, like what they're doing right now is they're writing algorithms to try and process those point clouds that we're seeing, that we see on the screen now as well, um, so that they can read and understand space, right? W what is a street? What's a tree? What's a parked car? What's a 70-year-old? Um, what's a seven-year-old? Um, and how should I make decisions about that? And if you think about it, you know, they're, they're writing a code which is, which is going to say, like, something that's moving at this speed and is this big must be a van. but. If it's a bit smaller and it's moving at this speed, that's a person. You know, we're encoding into these systems what a human is. Like, who's to say how fat someone gets before they start to become a van? Like, there's some engineer in in California trying to figure out that problem, and there's not a philosopher sitting next to them saying, "Well, what is human?" Mm. Like, um, uh, so you know. I, th I think architects c can have those kind of conversations. So, like we can go to a bar and have a cool conversation with a film director or an artist, as well as an engineer or a coder. Um, and so many other disciplines have kind of narrowed um, to the point where where that's not possible because they're all trying to get people ready for for the profession. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I, I think um, uh, I think we can have a lot to say in these contexts. Um, the, the challenge is just how do we how do we get in the same rooms, the right rooms? Um, uh, and I think that what that suggests is different forms of, of practice. I don't think that like Gensler um, are the ones to go out and collaborate with um, Google Waymo. Like um, I think that it may mean that that we might embed ourselves in some of these in some of these institutions. You know, I'm interested in the architect as technologist or the the architect as as urban planner, the architect as um, uh, storyteller or the architect as um, creative coder. Like, um, uh, I don't think that's a dissolution of the profession. I think that's a strengthening of it because it puts us in positions where we actually have the capacity to affect real change. So sort of the question that you bring up, I feel like it's been throughout human history sort of, not in a sense alarmist, with like new technology but I'm sure like in the end I feel like it's all worked out in the end like for example maybe when the car first came out everyone's like oh I'll just use my horse and every everything but in the end like we've sort of found a solution for everything and it's worked out I don't know does that still apply today or is today any different uh, I don't know what do you reckon um, uh, yeah it's interesting I don't, I don't know what you mean by it's interesting what you would say worked out looks like, you know. Um, uh, um, like I love the optimism, man. Uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to kill that. Um, uh, so how do, how do I be delicate? Like I don't know. Um, maybe I mean worked out uh, also means that you know that the, the 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 development of the car that you talked about that initially ran on lead petrol. Um, uh, it worked out for for the last generation. It worked out for my generation. Um, maybe it'll be all right for you, but if you have kids, I think they might have an issue. Um, like you should ask them uh, how how it worked out, because um, uh, they might have a different kind of answer. Like, um, 
depends. It worked out. You know, it depends on the time scale that we look at. Um, uh, we're not very good at looking at really meaningful and deep and long time scales. Um, we're good at work thinking about you know time scales that that that, that our life revolves around or electoral times electoral time scales. Um, we're not really good at thinking beyond four years. Certainly, politicians aren't because they don't give a shit. Like because um, they do something and then someone else is going to get the credit for it. Um, so I don't know. I think we need to um, think long term and then I think working out, yeah, it, it, it's not as simple as that. Um, so, so no, I guess um, uh, we could have done with a dose of skepticism about certain technologies um, the whole way through. Um, that at the moment, the, the, the way that technologies comes into the world generally um, is based on a model that um, that requires um, uh, you know, rollout and monetization as quickly as possible. Um, so things just get kind of pushed out before we really kind of understand their, their consequences across multiple timescales. Um, and I don't know if that should, should keep happening. Um, you know, like what was it, the iPhone 10 or something that came out with um, uh, the, the facial recognition thing? Like, so you, now you look at it and it opens for you. Um, a week before that, I think it might be been debunked now, I can't remember, but a week before that, someone came out with a, um, with a, with a, um, an algorithm that was supposed to be able to read someone's face and, and identify if they were gay or straight. Um, and if you put those two things together, like, like you know, the person in, in the iPhone 10 room wasn't talking to the researcher making that code about sexuality, but all of a sudden now you've got every per billions of people around the world storing their profiles on central Apple servers, and you've got someone who's written a code that can now tell whether those people are gay or not. Like that, like you know, and that's just a, that's just a shit you know that that I had in my head or that we know about. Like. Um, I don't know. Like it, it, it's it's worth thinking before something comes to market, and we just rush it out because we, if we can think we can sell it, then we put it out into the world. I think that's problematic. Um, so yeah. So I think um, I don't know, I'm not, and I'm not trying to be the the dystopian doom and gloom guy either. Um, a lot of these technologies have done wondrous and extraordinary things, and I and I and I wouldn't go back um, to some kind of medieval world where they don't exist either. Um, I just think that um, we n need to find ways of engaging with these things with sufficient complexity. Um, and um, the techno-optimists that, um, uh, that you might follow on Twitter, like Elon, Mo Elon Musk, um, that suggest that you know, they've got the solutions to all this stuff, um, uh, they don't. Um, uh, so he gets up like the thing I was talking about was what's called the you know, the most significant tech presentation since Steve Jobs launched the iPod when when Elon Musk um, launched his Tesla Powerwall battery and and this vision for for a solar powered future that's going to be run off Tesla batteries um, and it was captivating and everyone you know sighed a big sigh of relief and like oh we figured it out it's going to be all right we've solved climate change don't worry Elon's on it. Um, what he didn't talk about in that presentation was where all the lithium comes from to power this future. And, and like I said, he literally needs to buy Bolivia in order to do that um, and dig up this extraordinary precious um, uh, saltland ecology to do it. Um, and I think it's probably a good idea in the end. Um, uh, so I'm not suggesting that, that, that we don't and we keep on fracking the shit out of Canada. Um, uh, I, I just think that you know we can handle that kind of complexity. He could have talked about that as a slide in his PowerPoint presentation. He could have talked about the compromises that are there. He could have talked about well, you know, if, and if we want to use less lithium, then let's not need energy at the same rate that we currently need it. I, I might have figured it out. Uh, I've got this cool system going, but but actually, there's no such thing as clean energy. The the, the best energy is is not using it in the first place. So maybe we might have to. Reimagine how we commute. Um, like just talking about those kind of subtleties and complexities, I think is um, is useful. So I'm not trying to say technology is bad. I'm just trying to say it's complicated, um, and we need to engage with both the amazing, cool possibilities of the iPhone 13, 
at the same time imagining um, uh, the other side of that story and, and making informed decisions about um, uh, whether we want it or not. Yeah. The white, white, white jacket you've been trying for a while, yeah, hi. Sorry. Um, in the in the example, actually, of this uh, this one here, the textile mill, mm. um, there was a specific uh, comment that you had about kind of this specific knowledge around like um, weaving by hand that's that's yeah. being lost, and um, I'm just wondering if you have any examples or opinions on like whether there can be a productive overlap between kind of mass auto automation and um, doing things by hand, and um, kind of preserving that specific knowledge in certain cases like this one. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah. I, I, when we were out there, we were wondering, like, what would happen if um, Louis Vuitton, like, we went to the place where they make the the bags that you buy a Louis Vuitton bag in, in India. Like, you know, when you, I don't know who, who's got Louis Vuitton in this room, but you know, when you buy it, I don't fucking have one, but when you buy it, it comes in, like, a calico bag with Louis Vuitton stamped on the outside. We went to that factory. Um, uh, and we were interested, like, what, what would happen if for the 2020 season... Louis Vuitton like specified that all of their bags would be made from um, uh, Gujarati um, handwoven cloth, like um, these industries that are dying out, um, where all these apprentices now go and work for H and M or Zara or the the companies that supply them. Um, what would it mean if all of a sudden this massive global brand um, placed this mega order um, that reemployed um, all of the villages of Gujarat to, 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 to make these materials. Um, I, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but as a thought experiment, I think it's interesting to start to imagine what it means for someone sitting in Italy designing the next Louis Vuitton collection to think about the other end of that supply chain and to make a decision at this end, which is not about the way that it's going to sit in Beyonce or Rihanna's hand when they buy it or they wear it in the next music video, but the way that it might actually distribute resources in a different way at the other end. Like, I think that's an interesting question. Um, uh, so it's not to say that, you know, every every big brand should now start, um, um, you know, outsourcing to craft industries, but it's just um, to suggest there might be another way of, of, of thinking about that design process. And again, that was my idea from, from the first question, like what does it mean to, to collapse those two scales together? Um, yeah, I, I don't know if the villagers in, in, in Gujarat w would like that. I, I think we should ask them before we do it. Um, uh, but yeah, maybe that's something. Um, I was wondering what roles do architectural and cultural histories play in your speculations of the future city? Uh, architectural histories? Yeah, like what's the role of the past in your speculations for the future? Um, yeah, I mean, if there's, an, if there's a more marginalized industry than traditional architecture, then architectural history is certainly one of them. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm not. I'm not the the person that says, "Oh, history doesn't matter." You know, it, it, of, of course, it's in, it's important, and um, all that scholarship is 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 really really valuable. Um, I mean, personally, I'm less interested for, for for my own form of practice in like exploring, you know, the the Italy that produced Rossi um, and his and his traveling theatre. Uh, like that doesn't interest me. So there's this kind of trend at the moment. You know, like architecture schools have these kind of two camps. I don't know what you get. You guys have at Waterloo. I don't know if um, this applies, but but certainly on on my circuit in in the states, like these two camps. You know, there's the, the digital fabrication-y, We like robots, driverless cars, people, and then there's the neo pomo. We use pink, orange, and pastel colors and do kind of you know isometrics um, people. Um, <laughs> that that. Sounds familiar? Maybe, yeah. Um, uh, I don't like the Neo Pomo, um, you know, iconic arches, um, capitals, of columns with capitals on them, people. Like, um, you know, what, what, what you can see what, what, what these, two dis these two tracks uh, are kind of doing, though, right? Like, one, the, the Neo Pomo crowd is a reaction against the digital, 
Um, the other did is like doubling down, going, yeah, 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 let's keep on going. AI design, yeah, 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 that's cool. Um, uh, the Neo Promo crowd are kind of, um, uh, I don't know, I guess it's, it's this idea that um, at a point where our discipline is kind of on fire or being questioned, um, uh, one response is to, is to lock down and stick to the fundamentals and say, yes, we're interested in um, the traditions of modernism and postmodernism. We're interested in um, all the other architects that have gone before it. As a, and we analyze that and remake that as a means to kind of stake a claim for what's essential about what it is that we do. You know, when you look at um, Coolhouse in his um, Venice Biennale curation, Fundamentals, which is just trying to say, no, we do escalators, uh, windows, uh, services, um, that's our territory. Bathrooms, we got that. That's 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 architecture. Um, to kind of build walls and to consolidate the discipline through um, uh, going back to the to 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 its very core. Um, and I think that's part of the the genealogy that's led us to you know colourful isometrics. Um, uh, I think actually, like I was saying, I mean, this one's to your question that that I'm much more interested in. Um, at this point where the discipline itself is being questioned to explore entirely new forms of practice as opposed to double down on the traditions of what has come before it. So I'm interested in pulling apart all of that sort of stuff and actually seeing like the world has changed. How can the stuff that we do um, find new value as opposed to trying to double down and, and, and shout as loud as we, as we can to reclaim the value we once had? Um, so I guess that's my relationship to history. Like, I think we need to know all that stuff in order to figure out how we got here, but I'm less interested in um, uh, history as a way of legitimizing business as normal. Um, and I'm more interested in um, seeing the ways that we used to practice and the way that that form of practice is no longer relevant or as critical as it once was and thinking about something new um, and thinking about just new territories where we can do our stuff. Um, it's kind of a side, a side swipe at your question. Um, but hopefully it connects. Um, talking about what we can learn from history, uh, if we look at the great nations who once thought that they wouldn't fall, like the Romans and uh, mm -hmm. Mongolians, like these empires, uh, do you think the same fate um, but like, do you think the same destiny lies for this global world as one nation? Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't, again, I don't think it really matters what I think, but um, uh, um, if you're asking, um, uh, no, I don't, think, I don't think there's like some big looming collapse like on the horizon. I think it's gonna be a very slow and gradual uh, uh, expiration, you know, like if, if, at least um, the big momentous um, uh, meteorite hit um, or the city burning down would be, um, uh, there might be something cathartic in that. Um, but uh, I think we're too clever now. Um, I think it's now going it, to, it, it's, you know, all, all signs seem to point to this um, um, gradual entropy. Um, uh, like I think city everywhere is going to continue to spread. We're going to be continue to be better at it. We're going to optimize it. We're going to make it even more efficient and more powerful. Um, uh, and it's just going to drag itself out so that in multiple generations time, all of a sudden now um, uh, our, our kids, kids, kids um, uh, aren't going to remember um, uh, what wilderness was, um, but they're probably not going to care. Um, Not to be too often, or pessimistic or anything, but I think every uh, nation that was great at one point also thought that they're too good to fall, <laughs> or like too smart. Right? Okay, so that, that's optimism. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's not, I, th I think you're wrong. We're definitely going to crash. That's what you're. That's what you're saying. Okay. Maybe. Um, I don't know. There's this thing like um, there's a beautiful book um, that I'm not going to remember the name of. Uh, something about nature. <laughs> anyway, it, it, um, it's a 99% invisible 
ish, episode about it. Um, I'm sure Google will tell you, but uh, um, it talks about this idea of shifting baseline theory, right? That, that, that um, uh, you know, when our children, like the, you know, my my parents' generation, like, um, oh, how do I explain it? Okay, so when we were in the we were on the cargo ship in China, um, we were listening to the captain. We happened to be on board for this captain's last last voyage, last journey. Um, so he was doing kind of like a victory lap. He had his wife on board, and um, it was like his last trip before he retired. He was with Maersk, the world's largest shipping company, for um, 30, 40 years. Um, and he was talking about the ways that when they used to travel on these giant ships through the Caribbean, um, there was so much algae, phosphorescent algae in the water that at nighttime you could see the, the shipping lanes because as the ships traveled, their propellers would churn up the water and the algae would, would phosphoresce and it would glow green. So you would have these amazing green trails through the ocean. Um, and what they would used to do because um, the toilets in these ships are washed, uh, are flushed with seawater. So at night time, when you went for a pee, you could turn all the lights off, flush the toilet, and the whole bathroom would glow in this amazing neon green. Um, uh, and that was his that was his reality. Um, and now um, uh, there is enough algae in the water anymore to do that. Now, when you flush the toilet at night, it's just dark. Um, uh, and you know, I but. Um, but but I don't know that world, so that it's only when I hear that story that it becomes kind of shocking. And they talk about this idea of shifting baseline that 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 you know my generation doesn't long or doesn't feel that loss in the same way that his generation does. So now my norm that I'm born into isn't neon green flushing toilets. It's it's dark um, lights off flushing toilets. Um, and my kids, if I ever have any kids, will you know will have a different kind of baseline that they'll become accustomed to. So this shock of loss that we can kind of respond to because we can see it um, uh, is important, but it, it's, it, it, doesn't really, um, it doesn't really stay with us. Um, so that's what I mean. Like All of these things will change, but whether or not we'll care, um, that's, uh, that's the thing that's up for grabs. Um, and I guess it's partly why I think these kind of projects that we do, why I hope they're they're important or useful, is because they kind of like um, etch into the record um, uh, some of these kind of values that we think are are, are important or that are being that are being lost. You know? I mean, that's what that uh, the the Indian textile um, project is about: is to kind of create this sort of archive or this record. Um, It's just this side. What happens on that side? Doesn't matter. Yeah, that's a spirit. So after doing these uh, speculative films, do you think there could be any kind of, uh, do you think it can inform any kind of new political systems that we can see in the future? Because you can kind of, kind of, kind of see it going like two other ways. Like one, being very centralized and very, I don't know what you alluded to, maybe mm. everything being surveilled, mm. or it could be maybe everyone kind of having a voice and being more connected and almost creating a new like comments, like a virtual comments. Mm. So, like, what's your takes on that? Are those things mutually exclusive? No, Is it I mean, one they, or the they other? Can, they can coincide, I guess. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. probably that then. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, I don't know. Like, yeah. like, there's no. I don't. I don't. I, c I can't see a condition where we're going to have like we're going to come to some consensus. You know, and and all get together and figure it out, and say, okay, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go with a centralized government version. You know, are you, are you cool with that, North Korea? North Korea, said, yeah, yeah, okay, that's cool. Um, Germany, you cool? Yeah, 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 centralized government sounds good, and it's gonna happen. Um, so, um, you know, it, it's just gonna be shades of of those two endpoints and everything in between, really. Um, and those two things will coexist just like they coexist now. And I guess it's a it's a way of describing. Um, and pointing to um, what what's really going on with all of these technologies, which is, you know, in response to your question as well, like these aren't solutions to anything. Um, uh, no matter what people like Musk will say, they what they just do is exaggerate the conditions that already exist. 
and amplify those conditions in various ways. You know, they're, um, they're equal parts, um, good shit and bad shit. Um, uh, wondrous stuff and really fearful and scary stuff, purely because so are we. You know, like the same drone that, that, that we can discuss and talk about um, as delivering um, vaccinations and, and medicine to remote communities in Africa can also be used to spy into a 13-year-old girl's bedroom when she's changing, you know, and that same drone is used for both things um, because we do both of those things. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I, can, I can certainly imagine um, there's brilliant people that will develop, uh, uh, you know, a, a government of commons built on the blockchain um, uh, around cryptos and create all these extraordinary shared infrastructural systems. And I can also imagine um, there are people that are like, fuck that, I can't make any money. Um, uh, you know, I, I want to I wanna own it and manage it and restrict access to it so I can sell I can sell access, you know, um, and yeah, those two things are going to happen. Um, and that's again what I'm talking about is that when we're engaging and doing these projects around technologies, we, we should be doing utopian projects. We should also be doing dystopian projects um, because any kind of future is going to be somehow bits of both. And we need to sketch those things out in order to understand where the roadblocks need to be placed. Um, uh, what are the things we need to navigate ourselves around? What are the things we need to be wary of? And what are the things we need to celebrate and focus on? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, my question is not as smart, but, uh, I was looking at your Wikipedia page, and uh, you said even today, like um, that was uh, some about like architects wasting their times making buildings. Oh um, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> and as a first year, um, I was just wondering if you um, maybe also looking back to maybe when you were, I guess, around my age, maybe if there's any sort of words of wisdom or advice or anything, I guess you would kind of advise. Uh, <laughs> young architect um, to be um, like yeah any like I guess yeah any piece of advice maybe yeah to, but it kind of that's not that's not quit yeah I get it um, the yeah I mean I, I yeah I said that well I, I said architects sh um, shouldn't waste their time just making buildings um, actually uh, <laughs> um, which is just to say. Um, like, like, you know, there, there'll still be architects necessary in the traditional sense. There'll still be people designing buildings as, as we know them and understand them. There'll still be practices like that doing those kind of things. But I just think that's not the only thing we should be doing. Um, I think there's, you know, the building has been kind of displaced um, from cities as being like a really vital and active agent of change. Um, uh, and now our contemporary experience of cities, the, you know, the, the, the experience of the built fabric of those cities is just a really tiny part of what makes up our urban experience. Um, so we should be, as architects, also interested in um, the devices that are people, people are carrying around with them, this, the networks that we're connecting to, um, the way that, especially um, if we think in, in near future terms, the way that kind of the digital is intruding into physical spaces, that you know, our experience of a shared experience in this room is going to be very different based on what, you know, what headset or contact lenses or whatever it is that you're subscribed to, whether you're an Amazon Prime guy or a Netflix guy, you know, might change the nature of what this, this, this space is, just like these kind of green screen features that I was sort of talking about. Um, so as architects, we need to design in the digital spectrum as well as the physical spectrum. You know, we need to be thinking about um, uh, buildings as networked objects. You know, they're not just made out of you know, bricks and steel, but they're also made out of pixels and photons. The, the metrics of things on the screen, resolution, um, refresh rates, are now going to become the metrics of physical space as well. Um, they're not going to replace it, but they're just going to be overlaid on top of it in a way that can no longer be, be pulled apart. Um, so I think it's a really exciting time to be an architect, actually. Um, 
and you can be an architect of game environments, of augmented reality territories. You can be an architect of um, uh, real physical stuff and like get get super into like a brick. Um, uh, but you can also be an architect of the network um, and say, well, I'm not going to design a building. I'm going to design an app um, like that, 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 that reuses existing building stock. I mean, that's what Airbnb is. It's an, it's an architectural project. Um, but they're not making any architecture at all. I mean, they are now, but they weren't originally. They were just like reimagining um, forms of occupation. Um, and it was one of the most disruptive things to happen to cities for good or worse, for better or worse, um, in, the last, in the last decade. Um, so I think you should, like all, all the stuff I'm talking about should make everyone in this room feel empowered um, because you're on the cutting edge of the potential for change. It shouldn't make you feel um, useless. Uh, it shouldn't make you feel disappointed or despondent. It shouldn't make you quit and go and do um, computer science. Um, it should make you double down and go, fuck yeah. Um, uh, we're in the right place. We're doing the right thing. What we're doing is really, really important. It's more important now than, than it ever has been. Um, uh, so this is more a rally cry um, than, a, than a kind of a warning. Um, uh, so hopefully you guys take that take that to heart. Um, and I guess what it also suggests is that you know there, there are certain things that that we've always done, um, which now you like it's your job to question. Like I, I'm interested in like normally when we talk about cities or buildings, you know we we use the phrases like human centered design as being things that that are really positive. You know, oh, yeah, human designed city, that's great. And I'm sure you've had lectures like that where people have shown images of like tree lined streets and people chasing butterflies or flying kites or something. And it's you know, it's all about like designing for human values. Um, you know, uh, and that, that you know, we see how that's worked out for us, right? Um, like maybe human values, um, putting the human at the center of our design process is actually a, the wrong idea. Like I'm, I'm much more interested in um, not human-centered design, but like uh, wetland-centered design. Like what does that look like? What does is, what is atmospheric-centered design look like? What does whooping crane-centered design look like? Where maybe we have to make some compromises. It's not just about our own comfort. Um, uh, so, you know, when we start to think about think about those kind of systems, what does it mean to design for non-human clients? Um, a lot of the language, um, forms, and and procedures of architecture starts to collapse, actually, um, uh, or at least isn't sufficient. Um, I think that's a really interesting challenge for for someone starting first year. Like, what are the what are the alternative value systems through which we might design? Like, I think that's a really urgent and interesting question. In a way, one of the questions of our generation, perhaps. Um, I mean, I just wrote a book, uh, Machine Landscapes, available now, Amazon, um, uh, which was looking at um, machine-centered design. Like, the the most significant spaces in the world now are almost entirely empty of people. Like the Facebook data center that we toured through on our, on our lecture is, a, is, a, is actually, whether you realize it or not, is a, is a, is a building that you've all visited you know, 100 times today. It's a building that's at the center of your lives, but it's a building that you can never visit. Um, it's a building that probably has about six, six people left in it. Um, uh, these machine landscapes um, are starting to run, uh, run our lives in our cities. Um, but they don't take the same kind of architectural form as we expect that they would. You know, like I said um, in, the, in the talk, the, the, our generation's cultural typologies aren't these massive museums in Dubai. Um, uh, they're data centers that, that, that no one looks at, that aren't the subject of El Croqui monographs. Um, the real star architects of our age um, uh, is Neil Sheen and Partners, um, who has the contract to make Facebook data centers around the world? You know, like um, uh, so. I made a book that, that talked about all those type of things. You know, um, you know. We again, we talk, we celebrate Bjarke Engel's collaboration with Google, and that he's doing Google's um, headquarters in London, or those Amazon bubbles that are made in Seattle, or Norman Foster's Apple Donut um, in Cupertino. They're just waiting rooms. Um, uh, 
the real the real architecture of our, our, our machine world, the real architectures of city everywhere and technology are, are off in the middle of nowhere next to uh, hydroelectric dams um, without windows, um, uh, filled with um, the most glorious parts of all of our culture. Um, so design a data center, you know, that should be a first year project. Um, uh, and yeah, what does it mean to have no one enter it? Does that mean it's not architecture anymore? I don't know. Um, so I think there's lots of interesting projects and problems to be exploring. So don't quit. It's the punchline, yeah. The book was in our library, but I took it uh, home for reading week and left it there by accident, so it'll be back soon. <laughs> so <laughs> if you want to read it, it's great and really scary um, and good, but like, yeah, it's there. So if you need it <laughs> and you're looking for it, I right. have it. We have to finish her. <laughs> So I think it's a very like visually beautiful film, but the subject matter is like kind of disgusting and scary. So I was like wondering why you chose to represent it like so like beautiful and pretty. Like specifically like those lithium fields. Like mm -hmm. I feel like that's not somewhere I would want to be, but like I feel like I'd like it if it was on a Instagram like pastel yeah. vibes account or something. Yeah. Um yeah, I mean, there's a whole um, discourse around this, actually. Like, if, if you go, I'm sure whether you know it or not, you all have seen um, photographs from people like Botinsky, Edward Botinsky, like Manufactured Landscapes Territory. Like, I think him and us are the only, maybe there's someone else, the only people that have managed to, got permission to fly a drone over these lithium fields. Um, he's now the best-selling, most expensive photographer on, on, on Earth, and he takes photographs of mines and mega Chinese factories. Um, uh, and people buy them because they're beautiful. Um, uh, so there's a, a discourse around the aestheticization of these conditions, um, and that's not without problems, but um, there's a value in doing that as well, I suppose, and that's why we do it. Like. Um, uh, when we aestheticize some of these things, and you know, even the language that I choose to use to describe it um, is a language that's taken from, I mean, you know, inspirations of things like beat poetry and and um, uh, Kerouac and on the road, this kind of um, uh, poetic narration of the ordinary and the everyday. Um, it's trying to elevate those landscapes and and um, take them out of their context. Um, and put them within a narrative context so that we can actually start to relate to them in in new ways. So, like, I'm interested in the difference between something like what we call as a discipline data visualization, um, which is more a documentary view of these things, or a graph of like how much lithium is in Bolivia versus how much lithium Elon Musk has or whatever. Um, I'm interested in data dramatization, like how you imbue these conditions and places and sites with story so that everyone in this room can start to form emotional relationships to them. You know, I think there's something important in that process. Um, there's something valuable in that. And there's a way of using aesthetic practice to both connect people to these things, but also to talk about some of the subtleties and complexities and nuances within these conditions that, that non-narrative approaches might struggle to get at. You know, like there's, there's ways that we've always traditionally, historically um, used um, uh, aesthetic practice and poetry and narrative to talk about things that are, are really complex, to talk about um, things that demand a very individual approach, a very individual connection to. Um, and a lot of these conditions, like you know, the mines in Australia, which it's 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 too easy to just talk about this evil mining company digging this massive hole in the ground out of Aboriginal land. Um, that mining company is 
is now support, supporting those communities. Um, a lot of the Aboriginal um, uh, communities now find work in those mines. That doesn't make it okay, but it, it just makes it more complex and nuanced. You know, like these two different ways of valuing landscape. Uh, um, how do we kind of unpick that? Or how do we talk about that with sufficient subtlety and nuance? Um, and for us, um, uh, these kind of aesthetic practices help us to do that. Um, so, yeah, it's not to sensationalize them or to say that uh, actually the lithium mines aren't that bad, right? They're beautiful colors. Um, uh, but it's to kind of position it within this different kind of discourse um, so that we can form new relationships to it. Um, yeah, because it just, just saying, oh, the, the mine is bad, is it, that's not a sufficiently useful response. Yeah, but it's a good question, um, and it's something we've uh, thought about a lot. And I, I don't know if this is the right answer either. It's not the only answer, that's for sure. Um, okay, so I have, a, I have a question about happiness, essentially. So right now in this world, like, my happiness, so much of it revolves around the fact that somewhere on the other side of the world, somebody else is suffering for it, essentially. That's so twisted and disturbing. But it's really an essential part of, like, you know, third world society, or well, first world society. And I was wondering, like, if there is a solution to that, and if there is a solution, will it ever be realized? And would it ever lead? It would that lead to basically like the destruction of city everywhere? Um, uh, yeah, I mean that's a that's a that's a pretty grim thought. That yeah, your happiness is conditioned by um, uh, whoever made that T-shirt. That was probably someone in what is it? Fila, yeah, Bangladesh. Um, uh, um, yeah, I mean that, I guess that's what I'm. I'm trying to get at, um, I, I don't, I, I mean, I, I, I don't, the re, how do I, say, I, I don't think the response is, is to revert back to these conditions of the local. Like, a lot of times when faced with these issues, um, uh, people, the sorts of people that you might see standing up here are ones that have a practice which is about like urban farming and like growing tomatoes out of used yogurt tins and, um, uh, everything's going to be locally sourced, and we're going to resist these forces. Like I don't, I don't, I don't think that's a that's a future. Like there's there's no such thing as the local iPhone. Like what does a local laptop look like that isn't um, exploiting resources in rare earth in the Congo and um, cheap labor in China and um, a massive automated shipping industry that that, that brings it to us? Um, it's it's just not. A future that's um, that I find believable in any way. This this kind of localized future, um, but equally, I don't think the that these these globalized networks need to be as asymmetrical as as, as what they currently are. Um, uh, and that's a very easy thing to say and a very complicated thing to to achieve. But um, uh, like I think by doing some of the stuff we started to to play with, like what does it mean to for the for Filler's designer to actually be thinking about that person who's putting it together. How does that change the nature of that design? Um, I think that's interesting. Or like, how does it change um, someone here thinking about how much you should buy that shirt for and the value of that shirt? Like, um, I don't know how much that sh your shirt costs, but if you go into H and M, you can buy a T-shirt for like three bucks. You know. Um, uh, but if you really think about the embodied energy and resources in that shirt, like it, it shouldn't cost $3. There's no way in the world that a T-shirt should cost that little, um, no matter how you slice it or see it. Um, but maybe we shouldn't be buying a T-shirt for $3. Maybe if you bought a T-shirt for $30, instead you would wear it more and you would wash it and look after it rather than wearing it twice and then it stretches and then you throw it away because you know you can get a new one. Like maybe if we understood or considered the extraordinary precious minerals that that go into our phones, we wouldn't get the new one when our phone contract expires and we get that phone call saying, hey, we, we know you're a valued customer, would you like to upgrade? Um, that's very seductive, um, but like we're not getting the same phone call about like our engagement ring when like the jeweler rings up and says, I just noticed that your engagement ring contract is up. Would you like a new one? It's been 18 months since you had your last engagement ring. 
Um, we can dispose of it for you. Um, we'll give you a good trade in. Like, you know, there's different value systems that we attach to certain objects and not others. What does it mean to, you know, for your, for your grandparents to like, you're 16 now, uh, I've been holding on to this for you. I always wanted you to have it. It's my iPhone 5. Um, uh, I had this when I was your age, um, and I think it's time that you used it. You know, um, uh, you know, like we, we laugh, but it, but like, what's bizarre is 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 the fact that that's strange to us. That kind of world, because the the material in the phone is is no less precious than the material in in you know your grandmother's old wedding ring, right? Um, yet one we keep and one we throw away. Um, uh, I'm not suggesting that you keep your filler T-shirt um, for you know for your grandkids. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe that's interesting. Um, uh, but I think we can change the way that we relate to objects. Um, we can still have the T-shirt or the phone, but maybe our relationship to it becomes different. Um, uh, and I think we can start to, as designers, we can start to engineer some of those new value systems into, into the products and objects and buildings that we're making. Um, I think that's a really interesting challenge. No, thanks. That's fine. Thanks. Thanks for your questions.